<laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Menno Dain. I'm from the Netherlands, and I'm the chairman of Games for Diversity, which is a foundation that tries to contribute to uh, improve representation and inclusion of social culture minorities in the popular culture like games by making events. That's a mouthful, right? So let's bring it down for you. Um, basically, I started this uh, movement in 2013 when the gender discussion finally lit up in the games industry. I thought, this is all well and done that we are all angry and that we're not represented, so let's do something about it. So the whole uh, point was to come up with a more constructive and positive approach to uh, the discussion and uh, to work on inclusion and show people what it, how much value there is if you have a diverse group or if you have a diverse representation in your game, because I think it can be an enrichment, not a rule. Um, Games for Diversity is a stichting that is inzet for social culturele minderheden in games and ook in the games industry. Ik ben een game developer en ik vind het heel belangrijk wat wij met Games for Diversity doen, omdat wij developers de handvaten bieden om meer diversiteit aan hun games toe te voegen. Wij zien graag een breder scala aan personages en games en om dat te stimuleren organiseren wij game jams. Game jams zijn eigenlijk een soort hackathons waarin mensen in groepjes in een weekend een game maken rondom een bepaald thema. Door de verschillende evenementen die wij in binnen- en buitenland organiseren, waaronder dus de game jams, faciliteren wij een dialoog tussen gamemakers en gamers. Een van onze grootste en meest zichtbare evenementen is de boot op de Utrecht Canal Pride. En bij dit event laten wij zien dat game developers en gamers veel kleurrijker zijn dan veel mensen op het eerste gezicht denken. Tijdens de Pride dossen we ons uit als allerlei gamepersonages van Nintendo games, Playstation games, Xbox games, computer games. Een super kleurrijk geheel dus. We brengen ze samen om ze samen dus na te laten denken over hoe games diverser kunnen worden. De eerste game jam van Games for Diversity was een LHBTI game jam en we willen hier een vervolg aan geven. En daarbij willen we de Utrechtse gamegemeenschap betrekken. Ik denk dat Games for Diversity heel erg belangrijk is voor Utrecht, omdat Utrecht een echte gamestad is. We hebben hier de Dutch Game Garden, er zijn heel veel game studios, de indie scene is heel erg groot. En daarnaast is Utrecht natuurlijk ook heel erg roze. Games for Diversity zorgt er niet alleen voor dat er meer gepraat wordt over diversiteit in videogames, maar ook dat de diversiteit die er al is, zichtbaar wordt. Vanuit Utrecht opereren wij internationaal en bereiken heel veel mensen. En zetten we Utrecht op de kaart als roze gamestad. We actually have a better uh, URL now. It's called gamesfordiversity.com. Um, as you see, like, we, we've done a lot of things. We, we've done a lot of game jams. Uh, as uh, Romy already told, the Cannot Pride is one of our most visible events that we organize. And everybody dresses up as their favorite uh, game character. It's amazingly fun to do. Uh, and we're also part of the Dutch Game Garden, or I used to be used, uh, part of them. So I helped to bring in more diversity. We had a diversity day. Uh, we had incubation days that was open for everybody, and not just people who are into games, but also far more people, so that uh, was a way for us to include more women also in our industry. Um, we, uh, I organized Dutch Courage, which is a big event, uh, basically the biggest game showcase before GDC starts in San Francisco, and also in Cologne. Um, I always pick a couple of games that I think are more inclusive and more direct, and we call them the diversity picks, so that way we, we sort of give a little bit of leeway to more uh, inclusive games. And most of all, we organize a lot of game jams. I, I guess you're all familiar with game jams, right? Good, yes. Yeah, so sometimes I have to talk to an audience that doesn't really know about game jams, so that's good. Uh, what I like so much about the game jams is, uh, as you can see, we've done a couple of them, right? And in all kinds of ways, uh, either health or diversity or research. Um, but I was wondering, maybe we can do a Games for Diversity jam in Poland. Yeah, see, there you go. <laughs> Wonderful. And this whole talk is basically to get you excited to do one because it's super important and I think it's super valuable. So why would you participate? Okay, this is, uh, I only have 20 minutes, so I'll just skip this movie. Watch it on uh, gamesfordiversity.com and uh, learn why people are engaged in a game jam on religion. Um, this is Bernie de Kofer. He's one of my heroes. He, uh, he passed away two years ago. 
And he's a person who started a movement called the New Game Movement to include everybody. So his work is really important to me. And one of those aspects of the games that he creates is that you should be open to all kinds of rule changes. If you come up as a designer to make a game that is really strict and really formal and you don't allow people to make their own rules and have a more autonomous experience, uh, it might, need, might not be so inclusive. And as such, he's a, a big starter of this kind of uh, interesting games. So look him up. Uh, he's amazing. He wrote tons of books. And his games are a big inspiration to me. And also for the foundation. So if you do a game jam uh, on Games for the First Day, what do they make, right? Games like these. This is a game jam that was based on ethnic backgrounds. And the jammers created the game in a full weekend, and I'll just show you two of them. The Games for Diversity jam, to me, is really important because we are also a company that makes diverse games. Having a deeper... Participated in a game jam. Oh, sure. Okay, so one of the games that came out of the other game gems, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to skip the movie. Again, watch it on gamesforthefirstie.com. Um, this is one of the games they made, and they used your gender, your sexuality, and your ethnicity as uh, the difficulty level of the game. And what I'm finding interesting here is that uh, five years later, South Park The Fractured Hall uh, used that as a sort of joke for the game, too, to start the game. I'm not sure if it's related, but I'd like to believe so, right? That would be cool. Uh, we also go to other uh, countries. We've been to Brazil, helped up setting a game jam there, and now it's a thing, so they, it's a recurring game jam. Um, also in Australia, uh, my good friend Nasi Masin, she, she started a game jam, but she didn't want to have it called Games for Diversity because then it was, again, a Western thing to, be got, to, to bring indigenous culture. So that will be a little bit weird. Uh, and she did a great, great job there. And basically, she, she asked me, like, can you help me out? It's like, really? It's not that hard. It's not that hard to organize a game jam. Um, because basically, if you focus on a couple of things, think about ways to inspire and connect. Don't, don't try to make this a game jam that's about winning, or that's about rules, or regulations, or don't come up with all kinds of achievement systems that some game jams have. Just focus on getting people inspired and try to come up with solutions to connect the people, the different teams to one another. We do this by uh, um, sort of enforcing them to play each other's game. <laughs> uh, we, we sometimes shuffle the team conversation. We have all kinds of friendly achievements, like I like your, uh, uh, give someone uh, a compliment about their hair, give someone compliments about who they are, um, ask someone about their uh, social life or their personal life. All kinds of more the achievements are not on the game, but are more uh, socially oriented. Um, we also, like, I remember the first time we did a game jam. <laughs> it was a Games for Health jam, and people didn't sleep because they wanted to finish the game. Uh, obviously, that is all really fun and great, but if you have a job on the side, you can't really live the whole weekend and then go to your, back to your job, right? So <laughs> let people sleep. I think that was sort of the first lesson we learned. So instead of doing a 48-hour straight game jam, what the Global Game Jam basically is, we cut it down to basically 16, 20 hours-ish thing and then close down, have a drink, uh, enjoy each other's company. Again, not focusing on the project, but focusing on the social aspect of the, uh, of the game jam. Um, also, if, we, if you design for a specific audience, uh, we've done a lot of game jams, right? We've done religion, we've done uh, LGBTQ, we've done ethnic backgrounds, um, we, we've done uh, a skin disease one, and also uh, one with uh, migration children. Um, th this was in a time when uh, there was a, a huge migration wave from Syria, and we invited all the children from the nearby uh, uh, shelter set system. I'm not sure how you call it, like where you put, <laughs> where you put people when they don't have a house. Um, and we played games with them, and we connected them to the local children of Utrecht, and they played games together on a, on a big square in the city center. They got to know each other, 
and we hoped something come out of it. Actually, it didn't. Uh, I felt really sorry afterwards for this sort of not really well-designed uh, plan to bring people together. But I did it anyway, and I think I can be proud that, that for us it was really enriching, and for them it was a good way to get out of the system somehow. Uh, but I could have done better. Also, when it comes to uh, game gems, since they are about play, maybe you should play a couple of games with each other. Come up with all kinds of Bernie the Coven games, bring them in to sort of get people engaged and get people going. Um, and when you design a game, don't, don't go to a really boring venue. Like if you're in an old office space, it's obviously not the most inspiring place to be. So uh, we did game gems in a swimming pool. We brought, chill, uh, we brought uh, game gems to, um, as you can see here, to the Dominican church uh, and the monastery. So we were allowed to stay in the monastery for the full weekend. We had access to the kitchen. And they hosted us for free because we're doing something that resonates with their mission. And as such, you don't have to pay for location or whatever. So searching for a location that's cheap and that fits your game gems theme we really help you to uh, not only do it really budget-free, but also uh, to inspire each other a little bit more, and also automatically get the audience in. Oh, here you can see this is the game jam in the swimming pool. Uh, we did game jams in the forest and make games for nature. Uh, we had students that <laughs> would never be in the forest, and they stayed in the forest for the full night. Not the best idea, I can tell you. Someone actually went outside because it was raining, and he wanted to feel the rain. Not a good idea either, because uh, he had to go home because he was soaked and cold, and he didn't have any uh, spare clothes with him. Um, so what do you need to do this? Not so much. Uh, basically, you need Wi-Fi. You need uh, chairs and tables. And uh, you need the people. That's it. Just find the people, find a cool location that fits your theme, make them uh, host you for free, because it's bollocks if they uh, don't, because you're bringing a lot of value to their, uh, to their foundation. Or for, we've been to Amnesty International uh, a couple of times. They hosted us for free too, because it really fits their mission. So uh, choose a theme that you think is less uh, represented in game culture, find the, um, the place you need to be, and then host a game gym there, and they will do it for free. Um, so why? Is it going to be a game for the first gem in Poland? Uh, I hope so. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like, we can take a few uh, questions. If sure. There are. Oh, I was really quick. <laughs> well, it's better to be quick than to be too long, right? Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering if any stereotypical boy gamers gatekeep other, you know, diverse uh, people from uh, game society, I guess? I'm sorry, I don't follow. Because um, I've noticed something, and I don't know if it's a general thing, that stereotypical boy gamers um, tend to gatekeep other people from gaming, like, uh, you're gay, you don't play games, or you're a woman, you don't play games. Like, is it happening? Have you noticed this? Uh, I think the same. Uh, uh, yeah, obviously. I think if if you look around on on this conference as such, there are mainly men, mainly uh, white men, <laughs> uh, surprisingly. But uh, and uh, that differs though. In, per country, I think. Yeah, you're, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, like what you. What, what, well, actually, what you should do uh, in August, um, the women game jam is going on, okay. and we're organizing one in Eindhoven, and I think it's a it's a it's a global thing. So if you want to know more about it and you want to organize a women game jam, you should definitely do so. It would be amazing. And um, are you trying to do something to, you know, because you can organize uh, a separate s a thing for women, but you can also, like, um, encourage men and, you know, uh, majority to stop gatekeeping. And do you do something to stop that happening? 
well, it's kind of hard like, to solve a big cultural problem. I think what we do is we organize um, uh, discussions night in the pub. Uh, where we invite a speaker to talk about their experience and how they uh, did it. Like last time we had uh, the um, chairman of the Dutch, or ch chairwoman, sorry, of the, um, the Dutch Foundation for LGBT Rights. And she explained to us how we could reach out to the market and reach out to the industry and what kind of initiatives are already out there to make the industry more inclusive. We're part of the, we have a, in the branch foundation called DGA, we have a separate chapter, that's us. We focus primarily on um, doing research on what's the state of art now at the moment. Are people excluded or included? How many women are there in the company? How, many, uh, how much diversity is there? And how can we help them do this? Like the numbers always work to get your point across, which is, in my opinion, a little bit stupid. But hey. Uh, but apparently, we need them first or so, I don't know. So we're doing a big study right now on this regard. Um, we're um, talking to a lot of companies to get them included um, and get them, help them think about diversity a little bit more. Uh, I think the discussions night don't really help there because it's basically your own crowd that you invite in. So you really need to reach out to other companies. And I think we do that through the branch organization right now. Uh, in the Slack channel and also with um, uh, writing proposals for how to hire a more inclusive staff. Yeah. Okay, thank well, you. We basically do a lot of things, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Thank you, you're great. <laughs> no, no, thank you, that's just, well, just a surprise. That's all. Sure. Hey, um, so... This is something that I've noticed in a lot of game jams, and regardless of the scale, uh, sometimes people bring in already teams, or like they, uh, when you come to a game jam, you kind of go with a crowd, and you kind of don't network a lot. And yeah. You come out of it sort of the same way you came in. True. And that happens like in game jams for 50 people or 500 people. Yeah. And usually organizations try to, to find some way of, of breaking that. Yeah. Uh, what tips do you have on uh, achieving that? Well, I can send you the whole things that worked and didn't work. We we'll have to write them down first. But um, I, typically our game jams aren't, aren't larger than 65 people. So that's good, because otherwise you don't really get to know each other, then you're just lost in the crowd, right? And then as an organizer, you don't know who, who is, so you can't really connect people. Uh, we try to ask people not to make teams in advance, but if they want to, pr that's fine. Uh, we do a lot of uh, feedback sessions throughout the um, uh, game jam, which for some is annoying, because they really want to work on their game, but that's not the point. The point is to get to know each other and to be inspired by one another. And so we do the concept session and then we have a plenary um, feedback session. So everybody pitches their own concept to everybody and everybody knows a little bit more about each other. Then we work towards the paper, paper prototype. Then there's a play session for the paper prototype. Then you, you, you try to sort of encourage people to play together. And also, you make sure that the room you're in is just one big room and not like all these separate boxes that you have in some game jams that you're just locked into an office and then can't get out and don't want to get out because it's so convenient. So yeah, I think that th those are like really clear pointers, I think. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering, what are the costs of uh, making a game jam like for uh, 500 people in... 500 people? Yeah, for example. I don't know. I would never do a game jam for 500 people. So, uh, 100? Uh, well, basically, it should be free. <laughs> well, if you like... Right, but when uh, I organize the thing, yeah, the game mm -hmm. jam, so I have to pay for the place, for the space, I mean. Right. Uh, for the chairs, stuff, and tables, yeah, also. Oh, okay, so first of all, I think you should ask people who participate to pay to, 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 to enroll in the game jam. We charge them 35 bucks 
And they got, that's like 35 euros is like 120 slotty, something-ish. Yeah. Like, let's ask them to pay 100. So you're able to do some catering. So you can give them lunch, and you can give them dinner, you can buy some drinks. You can get them from the grocery store yourself, right? And then cook or whatever, so make it cheap. Uh, the space that you rent, you shouldn't rent. Yeah. You should find a company or an organization that has a mission statement that fits the theme of the game jam. For example, we had the LGBTQ and the ethnic backgrounds at uh, Amnesty International. They hosted us for free. We had the Rich and Game in a monastery. They hosted us for free. We had a swimming games thing in a swimming pool. They hosted us for free. Basically, I never pay for rent because I don't want to. And, if, and it's also a sort of check if your theme fits and it's uh, narrow enough for people to care. So basically, you shouldn't, like, I never paid for anything during the Game Jam. It never cost me money. And I think that's, that's a, a personal rule. I, I'd, I'd love to do voluntary work and I'd love to put in effort, but I pay in time, never in money. All right, thank you. Yep. So basically, you can do it too, right? You, you, don't, you don't need a budget. Hi. So you briefly mentioned about um, a gaming project that helped integrate refugees with um, in the Utrecht, Syria. Yeah, example, we felt miserably there. That, that yeah. didn't work. So I'm just really interested about why it didn't work because obviously it's a really good it's a good idea. True. Uh, and like projects use sport to help integrate migrants. So just interested about why didn't have any good outcomes. Yeah, I think we basically did everything wrong that you could do wrong, and at the same time we did everything right, because we did it, right? So, the, um, we, we asked children to come with their parents to, uh, to Utrecht Central, to, 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 to the Neude, which is a big square in the city center. They came in by bus. So there's a, a huge bus coming in, a lot of logistics and uh, to get the bus there and to get people from the uh, refugee center to, uh, to Utrecht and, and, and arrange for all the costs and whatever. And then uh, basically they were put on the square, <laughs> they were playing the games, and then they had to go back to the refugee camp. They, they weren't allowed to stay longer and we had, didn't really have a program for them either because we were going to make games. But we played a lot of games together. And the local children played with them, and the game designers played with them, so that was really, really good. And we got to meet each other, and a lot of game designers were a little bit scared at first because we didn't know the people and we didn't know the culture, and they just understood, oh, wow, they're just people, right? So that's a big win mm. for the game designers. Not so much for the refugees, though. Uh, and then the refugees were just put on, um, on the, <laughs> the person said, bye. <laughs> And they didn't come back. We weren't able to, to show the games that we developed uh, inspired by them. Or, um, and that so that was stupid. But we couldn't find the money nor the logistics to, to get them back again. Um, so that <laughs> even though people really liked the idea and it sounds really good, I think the, like how we did it was really awful. And I would never do it again. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thanks again. And uh, do the, if, if you want to do a game jam in Poland and need help, uh, basically it's not hard. Just do it yourself. It's fun. And uh, just give me a call. Thanks. Thank you.